eternal blessed God. Amen. Now look with me, if you would please, at chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Father, we would pray that you might speak to us now, and that we may behold wonderful words from your law. And let the words of this, your servant's mouth, and the meditations of his heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You may be seated. <clears throat> I want to share with you this morning a part of a presentation that I gave this past Friday evening, and I want to share it in the context of the church and what our response should be as the church. And I'm going to ask that you would listen very closely and very attentively and give me time to develop this case that we're going to make that I might share as to why we have a Christian rep response in this situation. And don't allow the title to cause you to turn off your mind and not have an ear to hear. Will you do that for me? Just have an ear to hear what God might have to say to you. The title that I chose this presentation that I gave was Crisis in the Black Community in West Virginia. Does anyone care? Crisis in the Black Community in West Virginia. Uh, does anyone care? One of the things that I get the opportunity to do a couple of times a week that brings me great joy and I have a lot of fun doing it is I go to two elementary schools, Piedmont and Glenwood, on Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, I have about 25 or 30 youth that I work with, elementary age kids, in a character education uh, class. And when I can't go, my faithful compadre, Brother Greg Schaefer, go in my place. I am amazed, truly amazed, at these young people's interest in wanting to learn and how they can learn the definition of words like character and leadership and integrity and use them in sentences. And when we give them assignments, they come back the next week, a whole week has passed, they come back the next week with their assignments eagerly to share what they've learned. Something interesting happened the first day I went to Piedmont Elementary. I didn't know that my main man, Melvin, was a student at Piedmont. And so when I walked in the door of Piedmont Elementary School, I heard this voice, Pastor Watts! <laughs> and I, I said, surely not. <laughs> and I turned around, and it was Melvin. And he went on to say that that's my preacher, that's my pastor. Amen. And I go to the church that he attends. Yeah. And he wanted to tell everybody he knew my wife and my children and my whole family. The next Sunday, I saw Master Melvin. He came up to me, and he said, don't come back to my school anymore. <laughs> I say, well, Melvin, why not? He says, because it embarrassed me. I say, well, Melvin, had you not told people that you knew me, I would not have told. <laughs> and I said, let's practice this. If you don't tell, I won't tell. <laughs> and so people won't have to know that we even know each other. That's a true story. We had a great conversation over that issue. But I'm amazed that these kids, their minds are like sponges. They're eager to learn. They are quick. They are sharp. They're moving and jumping all over the place. And so then I am somewhat appalled when I received the report, the disaggregated data that shows that there is a significant achievement gap between black and white kids in Kanoa County schools because Piedmont and Glen. Uh, Glenwood are probably the most densely populated schools with African-American children in the state. Over 80 plus percent at both of those schools. And the classes that I have, 90 percent of the youth that in the 21 century after school program are African-American children. 
But a few years ago, the Office of Civil Rights came to West Virginia. They audited select county schools, and they cited Kanawha County, and they cited Raleigh County for the overrepresentation of African-American youth in special education, learning disability, behavior disorder, mild mentally impaired, et cetera. Overrepresentation, disproportionate overrepresentation, and an underrepresentation in the gifted program. And to Dr. Duren and Kanawha County Schools credit, I, I credit them and I applaud them for taking seriously this citing and doing some investigation and going back and doing some retesting. And when they went back and looked at the situation again, what they found is there are many African-American students that have scored high on the Stanford 9 test that's given to students grade 3 through 11, but for some unknown reason, they were not tested for the gifted program. And so many of them have been tested, and more students from the African-American community have been placed in the gifted program. There is a crisis in the educational system as it's affecting African-American youth. The disaggregated data compiled by Dr. Duren's office shows that on all the standardized tests given by Kanoa County School, the Stanford 9 grades 3 through 11, the 8th grade Explore, and the ACT and SAT college entrance exam, there's a huge disparity in performance, as much as 25 percentile points. For African American males, they test about at the national average in the third grade, and they lose ground all the way through till they graduate. They fall further and further behind their peers, particularly in reading comprehension and in mathematics. On the ACT and the SAT test, it doesn't get any better. The low-income white youth in the non-college preparation curriculum, to their credit, are outperforming the high-income black youth in the college preparation program. And that's why several weeks ago, we had given a presentation and said that the Promise Scholarship, by and large, will not help poor youth, black or white. And in the newspaper on Saturday morning, there was a front page article basically stating the same thing, that the Promise Scholarship, which requires a student to have a 3.0 grade point average on certain core classes and then have at least a 21 on the ACT or a combined 1,000 on the SAT to qualify for the Promise, all the research shows that youth from higher income families normally perform better on the ACT and the SAT test. And I'm not being critical, I'm just stating what the facts is, what the obvious facts are. And so when you start using that criteria to determine who gets into college and to determine how you divvy up the money, what you end up doing is giving money to the people who ought to be able to afford to send themselves to school. All I'm saying, let's just be truthful and honest. If the goal of the Promise Scholarship was to provide some money for upper income people, let's just come out and say it. Let's not try to pass it off as some program that's going to help the masses of people. And I think that once all of the data comes back in, I think that there will be a look at this to make sure that you create an equal and a fair playing field. Now don't get me wrong, I am not here suggesting that you should not reward merit. I believe that merit should be rewarded, but I believe that there also should be a fair playing field. And if there isn't a fair playing field, then those who are in the lower rung of the socioeconomic ladder never get a fair chance and fair access to the resources. So the crisis in education is, is easily documented through the test scores and the low performance of students. When you look at the, the disciplinary referral, it literally goes off of the chart. And Dr. Kashima will be more than glad to sit down with you and give you a presentation. Many black kids spend so much time in the office for disciplinary reasons, there's no wonder they can't learn anything, not in the classroom or not. It's a problem. And I'm not pointing the finger at any one group. I'm saying it is our problem. It is parents' problems. The parents have to be more diligent. They have to be more involved. They have to take a more active role in their children's education. They cannot abdicate the education of their children to the public school system alone. But it's also the public school's problem because the research says that if children get to school, if they get there, then the public school has them six to seven hours a day. So if there are high expectations from principals and teachers, if there are high standards set, and if there are teachers there with a passion for teaching that are competent, that have skills and the instruction that poor children, regardless of whether or not the, the parents come to PTA or not, they can learn. That's what the research says. And so we want to keep blaming parents Let's give the parents who get their children to school every day, let's give them some credit. If you get them to school every single day for the most part, if they're there six to seven hours of the day, and someone is being paid to give instruction, 
they ought to be able to impart some instruction in our youth ought to be learning. So it's our collective problem. We as a community must come to bear and realize that the public school system belongs to us because we finance the public school system. And so we have a vested interest to make sure that the public school system perform and that all youth are being educated to a high level. Because if they aren't being educated to a high level, then we're not getting the return on our tax dollar investment in public education that we ought to get. And then we're going to spend other tax dollars on other social programs trying to remedy the problem. And all of the studies show that youth who don't get, higher, get quality educations are much more likely to be involved in juvenile crime, to end up in the juvenile justice system, to end up in the adult uh, system, and to be a drain on the other social resources, the other social programs that are designed to try to address some of these issues. Am I making sense? There's no way around this, ladies and gentlemen. There's no around, nowhere around the church. The church cannot abdicate and walk away from public education, even if you have your children in private schools. And if you can afford to do that, God bless you. Because it's your responsibility as a parent to try to get your child the best education that you can provide for your children. That's your job. But you cannot just abdicate and walk away from the public school system because the masses of children in West Virginia in particular, in the United States of America in general, the masses will be educated in the public school system. And so right now at the Supreme Court, the nine Supreme Court justices, they are arguing and debating as to whether or not tax dollars can be used for vouchers to go to private schools. To me, it's a non-issue. Let people give them the money, let them put their kids where they can get an education. But we've got to fix the whole system. Giving vouchers to a few to escape the incompetence and poor performance schools does not solve the problem. The masses still are going to be in the public school system, so we have a vested interest as Americans and as West Virginians to make sure that the public school systems are working for children. Now, you don't have to say amen because at times I don't need help. <laughs> A crisis in education. The crisis in education then manifests itself with a crisis in unemployment. Several years ago, we did extensive research on the unemployment system in West Virginia and how unemployment data and statistics were put together. And I was quite surprised what I discovered. And I realized that most West Virginians were just like me. They did not even understand unemployment statistics. When the, when the Bureau of Employment Programs issues the unemployment statistic, it says that unemployment in West Virginia is 6.1%. That does not mean that only 6.1% of people in West Virginia are unemployed. You would think that's what it meant. But that's not what it means. The unemployment statistics is calculated basically by the people who are seeking employment through the Bureau of Employment Services, and those people are still drawing unemployment benefits. So once you stop drawing unemployment benefits, they stop counting you. So the only, only people that get counted for unemployment are the people who are still actively seeking employment and the people who are currently receiving unemployment benefits. Are you following me? So what you have is the, the, the true unemployment rate is significantly higher than what they report, for example, if I never draw unemployment, then I, I never get counted as being unemployed. If I never work, I never get counted as unemployed. If I draw welfare, I'm never counted as unemployed. The only people who are counted in the unemployment statistics are those people who have been employed, who are now unemployed and drawing unemployment benefits, and who are still reporting to the employment, uh, employment office seeking employment. So the unemployment rate, all it really does, it tells the business community how difficult it's going to be for them to hire people from the pool of people who are really looking for work. Now, we challenged those statistics, put together a report, and submitted it to the former governor, Cecil Underwood. The director of research and programming, now retired, Dr. Ed Merrifield, wrote a letter back, and he says, Reverend Watts is right. The unemployment rate totally misguides, misdirects, and it masks the true unemployment rate. And he went on to say, particularly for African Americans, Murfield then went back for three years, analyzed all the unemployment data from 95 to 97, wrote back and said that during that period of time, even from our data, the unemployment rate for blacks was probably two to a half to three times higher than that what we reported. The unemployment rate for black youth, as compared to the national average, the national unemployment rate for youth is about 14 to 15 percent. The unemployment rate for white youth in West Virginia is about 27 percent. The unemployment rate for black youth, Dr. Murphy, I'm not making this up, Murphy said it's 50% if not higher. 
and no one is talking about it. So it's only natural that if there's poor education and low performance in the schools, then people would then have difficulty finding and maintaining gainful employment. But it doesn't stop there. You've got to trace the dots. So a crisis in education, a crisis with unemployment, which leads to a crisis in the criminal justice system. The United States Census in 2000, this is census data now, I'm not making this up, go to the internet, check it out for yourself. They reported that in the state of West Virginia, African Americans make up roughly 3.2% of the state's population. There are about 56,000 African American people in the state of West Virginia. About 3.2 of the state's 1.8 million population. However, African American people comprise 33% of everybody in prisons and jails in West Virginia. And no one is talking about it. 33%. And only 3.2% of the state's population. And it's not being discussed. The former Secretary of Military Affairs and Public Safety, whom you know, a man of impeccable character and integrity, Mr. Otis Cox, who used to sit right there every Sunday morning, had George Washington University to do a, re a study of West Virginia's prison system, I got a copy of the report and what George Washington University says, an independent research group concluded that West Virginia's prison population will increase by another third between the year 2000 and 2005 unless something is done. That report is down at the state capitol and no one is even talking about it. George Washington's report went on to say in the 1990s, West Virginia had the second fastest growth in its prison population in the United States of America, second only to the state of Texas. Yet nobody's talking about it. But there is discussion, and we're continuing to allocate money to build more prisons to debottle the prison system. Now, I am a law and order type guy, and I strongly believe that violent people ought to be locked up. They have to be taken off the street. Those who will not buy into the social contract that say you're going to be a law-abiding person, in particular when it deals with violent crime. But the problem is, is that we're locking a lot of people up that are not violent criminals because we've decided that we're going to have a war on certain communities. The McNear, no, no longer McNear, but simply the News Hour now, for those of you who watch public television, they did a special about three months ago. I have a video copy, which I've showed to some people. They looked at the research, and they said, let's take a look at all the data. Who uses drugs in America? Who possesses drugs and who uses drugs? They did all the research. They had a professor from Georgetown University, a former drug czar under the Reagan administration, and a former federal prosecutor on a panel talking about this issue. And here's what they all agreed to, that in the United States of America, the various people groups possess and use drugs commensurate with the representation in the society. Let me explain to you what that means. Hispanics make up about 11 to 12 percent of the nation's population. All of the data done by the United States government says that Hispanics possess and use about 11 to 12 percent of all the drugs that's consumed in America. African Americans comprise 13 percent of the nation's population. The United States government says that African Americans possess and use about 13 to 14 percent of all the illegal drugs in this country. The Caucasian community comprises 70 plus percent of the nation's population, and the United States government says that Caucasians use and possess 70 plus percent of all illegal drugs in this country. Now, you would think that if people are possessing and using drugs at that percentage, there would also be the same representation in the criminal justice system, but it ain't so. Of everyone that is arrested for illegal drugs, blacks comprise 35 percent of all arrests, 54 percent of all convictions and 70% of everybody who goes to jail for possessing illegal drugs. And that's all done under the auspices of the United States government war on drugs. Now someone has to speak to, ish, to, to, to the truth to this issue. I'm not condoning drugs. I'm not saying that we should be easy on drugs, but I'm saying we need to know the truth about what's really taking place. Let's have a single law that applies to everybody. Let's not have a double standard that says if you possess crack cocaine, five grams, the equivalent of two 10 cent pieces, that's five grams, under the United States mandatory minimum sentencing laws, that will get you five years in federal penitentiary. Now, with the law, you say amen because you know I'm telling the truth. It requires 
it requires 500 grams, 100 times more white powder cocaine to get the same sentence. Now, what sense do that make? You have to start out with white powder cocaine to get to crack rocks cocaine. However, because crack is the drug of choice for poor people in inner cities, Hispanic and black, it receives a stiffer sentence. And whereas white powder cocaine is the drug of choice for middle class, upper middle class, and wealthy blacks, Hispanics, and whites, it gets a different sentence. And so the war on drugs is nothing more than a war on poor people. And so what we end up doing is incarcerating poor people disproportionately. And in inner city communities, poor people are disproportionately black and white. Now don't take my word for it, just read the Charleston Gazette newspaper and the Charleston Daily Mail, and every time they do a drug bust, eight to nine times out of ten, it's in Orchard Manor, Washington Manor, Roseburg Circle, South Park, Institute, Dunbar Bottom. Why aren't there major drug busts in South Hills, Cross Lanes, Edgewood, and Kanawha City? Because we've chosen to only police drugs in certain communities. And if we only police drugs in certain communities, we're only going to arrest people from certain communities. That's just the truth. As hard as it might be to digest, that's the truth. And so that is why when you look at the criminal justice system, you got a crisis. 33% of all those incarcerated in jails and prisons are black. Carol Shallop of the American Friends Service Committee, a white lady, got money from the Charleston Public Safety Council and from the United Methodist Church to do a study of West Virginia's juvenile justice system. All white people did this study. No black people were involved. They came and interviewed a few of us. She came back with an independent study, and here's what she came up with, that West Virginia has the highest overrepresentation of juveniles in its ju of minority juveniles in the juvenile justice system than any state in the union by percentage. West Virginia has an index of five. The, the 1.8 is considered high, and we have a five. The index is calculated by taking the number of youth in the juvenile justice system and then dividing that by their percent representation in the population. And so at every level, arrest, detention, transfer to adult status, incarceration, overrepresentation. In Charleston, black juveniles make up 22% of Charleston's juvenile population, yet in 2000, they comprised 52% of all juveniles arrested in the state. There's a crisis, ladies and gentlemen. And we just can't ignore and act like it doesn't exist. And this has all been done in the name of the law. And the law allows for it to be done because the law is not impartial and is not being applied consistently across the board. I had a parent from George Washington, Univer George Washington High School now, a white parent, correct that, John Adams Junior High School, came to me, and this is what she said. She said, I'm going to put my child in Stonewall Jackson Middle School. And I said, wait a minute, don't you know the reputation that Stonewall has? Don't you know the problem that Stonewall has? She, I said, John Adams is, is, is the elite. It's the creme de la creme. It's the top junior high middle school in the county, maybe in the state. She says, those people are living in denial. I said, what do you mean? She says, there are drugs up there, there are things going on, but nobody wants to come to grips and address those problems, the problems that exist. And I'm not throwing rocks at folk, but at some point, we gotta, we got to be open to the truth. I'm a truth seeker. And wherever it takes me, I'll go. If it indicts me, I'm indicted. If it indicts my community, then my community is indicted. And I think my message for my community is harder than any other message that I have to give about self-discipline and responsibility and independence and doing for yourself and not walking around with your hand out begging people for stuff and taking control of your own destiny. That's the message we have for the community. And we don't let up on that. But at the same time, you must speak the truth to power. Because there are people in high places who are implementing laws that are wreaking havoc in the community. And unless we are educated, unless we understand really what's going on, then our community is going to be destroyed. And this really isn't a black-white issue. This is a community issue. This is about our youth issue. This is about our community issue. Amen. Don't take my word for it. Call Dr. Hammonds, one of the preeminent economist in the state of West Virginia who gave a presentation several months ago at the Charleston Marriott. He talks about West Virginia having one of the highest out-migration rates of any state in the Union and one of the lowest immigration rates, and the people that leave our state are the fairest and the brightest. 
the most intelligent and the most educated and the best trained. And so what is left behind with are people with less education and less skills. My friends, what I'm saying to you is that if we don't develop the population of people that are left behind, if they're not getting good education to where they get the skill sets they need to fill entry-level jobs, if we keep filling up the juvenile justice system, if we keep making people convicted felons, we're not going to have people to, to fill jobs. We won't be able to attract businesses to come to West Virginia and set up shop if you have a decaying educational system and if you have an illiterate, uneducated workforce. Does that make sense to anybody? And so what ends up happening is those of us who remain, our tax is going to go up. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth and what politicians won't tell you. The reason we got to have video lottery and video poker, we got to do that because we can't raise enough taxes to take care of the social infrastructure. Because we don't have enough people with the skill set that are making enough wages to pay taxes. Can anybody else figure that out? And so we've got to manipulate money out of people. We've got to legalize gambling so that we can raise enough tax revenue. And, and, and the video poker lottery and all this legalization of gambling is nothing more than a political cowardness. When those political cowards won't tell the people in West Virginia the truth, we've got to raise your taxes because we can't raise enough revenue through people working and collecting taxes for business to finance education systems to build roads and our political infrastructure. I'm a prophet, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a prophet, and the truth must be spoken. And we're going to all perish with our heads in the sand because no one wants to speak the truth to power, and no one wants to pull the cover back and say, That's, this is the truth. All right. Now, we're not going to finger point and blame, but the truth is the truth. And let's come together and fix it. One more thing, and I'm going to quit. Not only is there a crisis in education, a crisis in unemployment, and the crisis in the juvenile justice and the criminal justice system, there is a, a looming potential health crisis that's not even been discussed. This is not my data now. This is from the West Virginia Department of Health, a report that was set on by the West Virginia Department of Health for months because they didn't want to release it because they didn't have a response to that report. In the state of West Virginia, blacks die from diabetes at a rate 100 times higher than those of whites. Black homicides are four and a half times those of whites. Black men die from prostate cancer 100% 100 100 higher than those than whites. But here's the one that nobody really wants to talk about. And that's this crisis with sexually transmitted diseases that we have in our state right now. They're all up. Chlamydia, gonorrhea, herpes simplex two, and HIV. According to the Western Department of Health, in the African American community, 18% of all reported AIDS cases were blacks. Blacks will make up 3.1% of the state's population, but 18% of all reported AIDS cases. 39% of all reported HIV positive cases. 47.5% of all reported gonorrhea cases. And 16.4% of all reported chlamydia cases. Let me just tell you something you can think about this one. Now, see, the, the easy thing to do is to conclude that blacks are more sexually promiscuous than whites. But if you know anything about statistics and you look at the mere numbers, to get that type of overrepresentation, every black person in the state would have to be sexually promiscuous. And we know that isn't true. No, there's something there that's not been discussed. I'm going to submit to what I think the problem is, and if someone corrects it, I'm going to hold this position. This whole HIV thing, what I believe the contributing factor there is, is that there are more black people that come into this state from urban areas, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., New York, Atlanta, and some of these other places. And we know that the people coming in from these urban areas are part of the drug cartel. And so many, I'm going to indict my own folk here now. Many of them are black. Amen. Most of the drug dealers coming in from Chicago, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, they are black. And they're coming into the community where there's a high HIV case. I believe that many of them are bringing the HIV virus in as they mate with young men and young women in the community. And that's why we see this pathology first disproportionately represented in the African American community. Now, I don't go to the town center mall much. I haven't been there in 2002. Only went twice in 2001. But when I'm walking the streets of Charleston, what I see 
is a lot of black and white kids don't have the same racial hangup that some of us had. And so what we found, we have a lot more interracial dating, a lot more interracial marriages. So if there's a problem in the African-American community, it won't stay there. When the HIV virus pops up into these hollows and these creeks and these rural communities where people don't get preventive diagnostic health care, we very well could have a major epidemic on our hands. But while we got our heads in the sand right now, because the numbers are high in only the black community, and no one really is that concerned about it. What I'm suggesting to you is this thing can easily jump over to the broader community, and then we will have a major health crisis on our hands. I'm not a prophet of doom. I'm just one who's looking at the numbers and the statistics and trying to take them to a possible logical conclusion and saying, someone correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm open to being corrected. But these are not my numbers, they're not my statistics, and it's not my data. I don't think that it is irresponsible to deduce that if a pathology exists in one community, we got a couple of doctors in here this morning, if you have an infectious virus in one community, if it's not addressed why it's in that community, what keeps it from spreading to the population at large? Now, someone help me understand how we're going to keep it from happening if we don't talk about it. And if we don't mobilize a strategy to try to address it, that's all I'm suggesting. So we got a crisis on our hands. We got a crisis in education. We got a crisis in the criminal justice system. We got a looming or potential crisis with the healthcare system. We have a crisis on our hands. And does anybody care? I believe some people care. And I believe that the people of God care. And I believe that Christian people really and truly care. And what it's going to take is a Christian response. The church postulating biblical solutions that are anchored in the truth of God. The people of God getting involved to make a difference to show people the way. It's going to take more than just preachers like myself ranting and raging and worrying out loud about how bad things are. It's going to take people rolling their sleeves up and say, look, I'm going to get involved somewhere. I'm going to make a difference somewhere. I'm going to bring to bear the standards of God's kingdom. I'm going to establish relationships with people who don't know the Lord, who don't know Christ, and who may not even be interested in knowing about Christ. But I'm going to recognize that right now they're in a state of crisis. And so what I'm going to do is not go in trying to impose my superiority and how smart I am and the fact I got all the solutions. I'm going to go in, love them around their knee, see if I can help address some of the issues they're dealing with. So if we have children that are illiterate, let's see if we can teach them how to read. If we have folk who are unemployed, let's see if we can get them in job training and help them find a job. Let's deal with the crisis. Let's deal with the hemorrhaging. Let's deal with the problem. And so doing, we legitimize ourselves as God's people, God's change agents, God's therapeutic medicine to bring healing and hope and help to those who are hurting. And in so doing, God will be able to put us in a venue, put us on a platform that we might preach the unsearchable riches of Christ because not only do we have a message that we can herald, we have methods and solutions that when applied, they address the problems that plague the community. Does anyone hear me today? The Apostle Paul, and I'm going to stop right here. In Romans chapter 9, this is the great Apostle Paul, the greatest of the New Testament theologians. In Romans 9, he's writing this great theological treatise. He's writing to the wealthiest church of the New Testament, the church at Rome, that Roman cosmopolitan city where the great philosophers were. There was wealth and there was affluence. But he writes to them and says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew and also to the Gentile. Paul was called by God, called by God and Christ himself, themselves, to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Is that not correct? Amen. Am I not biblically accurate? Amen. On that Damascus road, the Holy Spirit informed Paul that he was going to preach the gospel to kings, to potentates, but his ministry would be primarily to the Gentiles. Now, a preacher and a prophet, and this is what people don't understand, you don't get to choose your assignment. Your assignment is delegated to you. There are things that I say I don't want to say because I know that there are going to be people that's going to be upset, that are going to be mad. I'm going to get more criticism from both the black and the white community. But I don't get to choose the assignment. The assignment is given to me. The burden is pressed upon my heart. And there are times that if I want to sleep at night, I have no 
option but to discharge the message that God has put into my heart. I may have gotten two hours of sleep last night because I knew how that some of you would be looking at me when I shared these things. But this is something that has to be said. It has to be said in the context of the people of God to understand. There is a crisis in the land. We have the antidote. We have the solution. Now, if we are honest enough to accept the truth and nothing but the truth, so help us, God. If we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, then God will give us the wisdom. He will give us the solutions to address some of the problems. Now, we're not going to fix everything, but we can create an oasis in a desert land. We can create a, a refuge in a hostile place. And we can resurrect an alternative where we, people can see those folk who align with God's people, for some reason those kids become more disciplined in school. And for some reason those kids have better attendance. And for some reason those kids make better marks. And for some reason those kids' absenteeism and truancy are lower. And for some reason we're seeing a decline in the juvenile justice delinquency rate. Then the people of God can stand up and say, let me tell you about a man called Jesus. It's not because we're so smart. It's not because we have all the solutions and the answer, but we believe that there is a bomb in Gilead. We believe there is a physician there, and we believe there's a God that still sits high and still looks low, and there's a God who would empower his people with wisdom and with strength and with might and help his people develop the strategies that they need to bring to bear biblical solutions so that God can be put on display and God can be glorified. So the great apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, Writing to a Gentile church of mostly non-Jewish people. He says, let me tell y'all something. I speak the truth in Christ. I ain't lying. Paul sounds like a brother, doesn't he? <laughs> brother, oh, I ain't lying. Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and continued grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That is as powerful statement in the New Testament coming from an individual, a human being. Paul says, I know I'm called to preach to the Gentiles. I know that God has commissioned me to raise up Gentile churches and Gentile converts. But Paul said, I was born of the child of Benjamin in the stock of Israel. Paul said, I'm a Jew. That's what I was born to be. That's my cultural heritage. And he says, I cannot look at the people according to the flesh, my kinsmen according to the flesh. I cannot see such a negative pathology and my heart not be weighed down. So Paul said, I see my people under the oppressive regime of the Roman government. I see them and treat it like animals, beasts of burden. And he said, it weighs my heart down to think they're going to die and go to hell too. They're going to live in hell on the earth and die and go to hell too. So Paul says, I bear you record. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying to you. My conscience bears witness. Paul says, if it were possible, I would be accursed, he says. I'll go to hell if it were possible so the Jews could be saved. Now, I told you all a couple of weeks ago when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Paul about that. And did he just say that because he knew it wasn't possible? And as I told you last week, I'd preach the gospel in hell if you give me a round trip ticket. Then in chapter 10, as we close, he says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. It's that they might be saved. Understanding the pathology, understanding the negative forces, understanding the crisis in and of themselves, and getting all emotional about it does absolutely nothing. Amen. When you understand, at the end of the day, people need to be saved. Amen. They need to know the living Christ as the one who's forgiven their sins. Then you know their name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so as you're trying to address the educational issues and the criminal justice issues and the unemployment issues and the health issues, don't lose sight of the salvation issue. At the end of the day, it's all about trying to create a re relationship whereby you can share the gospel. So Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. For I bear them witness, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they're being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness and not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. What are you saying, preacher? What I am saying is that we have a unique opportunity as the Grace Bible Church. A unique opportunity as the Grace Bible Church 
to show that black folk and white folk, the sons, granddaughters, great-granddaughters of ex-slaves and ex-slave owners can come together, find common ground at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whether we agree on political ideology or not is irrelevant. If we agree on who Jesus is, and if we agree that Jesus has a great burden and a great compassion for those that are lost, and if we can agree that we have a mandate of the Lord that we're not making up pure religion and undefiled for the Father, James says in James chapter 1 is this, is to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction and keep yourself unspotted from the world. Amen. That if we understand the mandate of Jesus, that this is not the great suggestion, this is the great commission. And that we together can joint venture solutions to the pathologies in the community and in so doing create opportunities to share the gospel of Christ and people might come to know the resurrected Christ. Don't misunderstand. I learned something a long time ago. And I'm a man that's seeking the truth. And a wise old black fellow told me something I never will forget. It marked my ministry. And I was sharing with him my great pain over the condition of the African American community. And he said, young blood, just promise me this one thing. That in your zeal, you won't stumble over a white person who needs help. Trying to get to a black person who needs help. I think my work speaks for itself. That our commitment is to people that need help. But when you target the inner city communities, what you find is it's disproportionately black. But this is not a, a racist thing here. We're not trying to divide this thing based on race. And we're not saying let's help black folk and not help white folk. Anybody that knows me knows that's not how I operate that we equal opportunity in our providing services and trying to help folk. But you got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. And you might as well start in the toughest area and take on the bully on his territory. Take Satan on on his territory where he's ruling and reigning and say, no, we're here. We're the people of God. By faith, we're claiming this for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're not just going to say this whole group of people are destined to go to hell. I, just, I can't live like that because I don't believe it. I just simply don't believe it. Amen. I believe that God in his omniscience has allowed certain negative situations to occur so that his people can respond and he can show how much power he has to break through it all. Amen. That's good. That's good. Come back next week and we'll talk about the rest of the story and about what we believe that God has orchestrated a unique opportunity for us. As I shared with the Wednesday night Bible study, I believe that Grace Bible Church is strategically positioned to be God's special forces. And I love this military stuff. I wanted to go to West Point, but they wouldn't let me in. But I love this military stuff. Not this Rambo stuff, but the real military stuff. And one of the most incredible group of people in the United States of America are the United States of America's special forces. These guys are trained machines. And they're the guys that they sent in, and women. They sent in to Afghanistan to set up. They're the people down in the Philippines. And they're the ones they call and summon. They're like Saddam Hussein's elite guard. And I believe that God is calling us to be special forces, an elite guard to go into territories that many Christians wouldn't dare walk into. To dare to say, by the grace of God, we believe that we can make a difference in prisons and jails and working with at-risk youth and working with single mothers. We believe we can make a di difference in working with doctors and lawyers and people on that end of the spectrum because they need the Lord too. We're not going to leave anybody out. We're not going to cater to folk just because they got money and power either. That would be sin. That would be showing partiality. We're going to treat everybody as equal but to be God's special forces. Amen. Well, we can start that process today. Yeah, some of you sign up to get involved in this training to be the Child Evangelism Fellowship Special Forces. We got to wage war, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. You know I'm going to tell you the truth, don't you? I'm not going to tell you no lie. I'll share all these statistics with you next week. The fact that in the United States of America, we spend $200 million on Christian television, $100 million on Christian radio, 
$100 million on Christian books and literature. Over half a billion dollars is spent every year. Now, if it was effective, you would think by now we would turn this country around. It's not effective. There is no replacement for individual Christians. Establish relationships with individual human beings so that person can see your spiritual integrity, your love for the Lord, your sincerity and wanting the best for them and so that God can love them through you and they become convinced maybe there is something to these claims of Christ. Are y'all following me? God wants to love people through us, not from a satellite, not over the airwaves. The only reason I'm on the radio is I just want to talk to folk. Just want to talk to them. And you create at least a common understanding. They know where you're coming from. So then when you go and really talk to them face to face, there's some background. They understand where you're coming from. And you can have some, some dialogue. There is a crisis in our land. And I believe that, that, that many of you care. And that God can use this, ladies and gentlemen. He can use it to do something big. As I close, yesterday morning I had the opportunity to speak to about 100 youth uh, at West Virginia Tech with the Upward Bound program. And when I concluded my presentation, I asked them a question. I said, how many of you want to be great? And I said, before you stand up, let me tell you what greatness requires. Total sacrifice, total commitment, a willingness, willingness to serve and do whatever that needs to be done to serve and help other people. To my surprise, about half of them stood up. I said, if you really want to be great, you've got to start today taking advantage of every opportunity that you get to develop yourself, to sharpen your skills, to increase knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And you can't waste away one single minute, one single second of preparation. I said, let me tell you from experience. You see, once you get in the war, once you get on the battlefield, you can't practice how to shoot, then you better know how to shoot. Amen. See, once you get in the battlefield, there's little time for preparation. You got to be ready to wage war. Amen. And so what I'm saying to you young people here at the Grace Bible Church, we're trying to give you a, an opportunity to go through basic training, to learn the word of God, to catch a vision, to do something great for the Lord. And some of you adults, this is your time for preparation. When God puts you on the battlefield, you got to be ready. Amen. You got to be ready. Amen. Because there are going to be people shooting at you every day. Yes. Now, I don't have a martyr complex. And I hope that I've never been in an environment where my life is on the line. Because I want to live a ripe, a ripe old age, hope to live to be 100, and preach my last sermon at the age of 100, June the 30th, whenever I be 100. But I tell folk, I say, look, if you get next to me now, Folk are going to take shots at you. They're going to take shots at you. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. I, I went to a funeral the other day. I just went to a funeral. I had to pay my last respects. And the preacher, God bless his soul, he got up and half his time, he was preaching at me. And I said to myself, he could have saved all that good preaching time. He and I could have had conversation. Because no matter what he says about me, he's still my brother. I mean, we're going to work this thing out. We see some things differently from a different perspective. So I'm not going to fight back. I'm not going to shoot back. The shield is of faith. That's, that's what's going to do. You're not going to see me shooting people back. They can say what they want to say about me. They can say it. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it doesn't. But I've decided I'm not going to shoot back. I'm not going to fire back because if I fire back, I might hit the wrong person. You see? I might do more damage in firing back than just taking the shot. And if, if my faith is strong enough, and if I got enough warriors around me, and if we got a fortified testimony, then we can take some hits. Amen. Any good warship got to be to take some hits. Right. Any good battleship got to be to take some hits and still maintain the struggle and be in the battle. Amen. But the struggle is sweet. And the victories that we won are potentially great. And I'm calling for soldiers this morning. I'm calling for soldiers. If you want to be on the Lord's side, if you want to unite with us as we try to wage war the Lord's way, winning souls in this community, 
and training them up for the Lord. I just want you to stand up. I just want to see if you want to be counted. We're not going to put nobody out who's not interested. Don't get me wrong. You're still a member of the Grace Bible Church. You're still in good standing. We're still going to take care of you. But I want you to give you an opportunity this morning that if you want to say, Pastor, before you, God, angels, and witness, and I want to be counted this morning because I want to be a part of God's elite army, Amen. of God's special forces. Amen. Just stand before the Lord. Amen. And I want to pray for you.